Hi, I'm Leslie Ann, and you've been listening to Your Beautiful Day on the Gratitude Radio Network. Welcome to another edition of Your Beautiful Day, the Gratitude Radio Network. I'm Jen Hall, mother of gratitude. And with me today, we're going to be talking a little bit about swagger and everything you need to do to unleash your swagger and become everything you want by Leslie M. And we have with us Neil Haley. Hey, Neil. Hey, what's going on, Jen? Excited about our guest and uh, always interesting about this whole clubhouse connectivity. And I'm excited about her. And she seems so motivated to talk to, with us today. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be an amazing day of gratitude. Pearl, how are you doing today? Hey, everybody. It's awesome to be here. So this is like right down my alley. You know, as a life coach, this is I love just keeping it real, tell it like it is. And let me just tell you, Swagger, I'm actually, I'm excited about some things I want to do with this book. So I am psyched to be in here. So let's kick it off. Oh my gosh. Okay. So gratitude is something that everybody needs. It's a superpower, but we are bringing you a superwoman that has something else. And that is unleashing the swagger in yourself. Welcome Leslie M. Hey, beautiful people. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely excited. And see, I love the whole setup. You really, I could tell you have the swagger and the fact, look at you, you have your books all lined up perfectly with your book and everything and, and your whole brand totally living your brand, aren't you? Oh, listen, this is my absolute purpose in life. I eat, sleep, breathe swagger. Excellent. All right, Jen, first question. Hey, Leslie, tell us about your book and how the pandemic has, has brought out the swagger in you. I have to say I had swagger before the pandemic. But before we we get into all of this, I want to make sure that everybody understands my definition of swagger. Because when we hear the word, we often think of that show off peacocky, arrogant, in your face kind of thing. That is not the kind of swagger I'm talking about. I have redefined what swagger is. My definition is it's the ability to manifest who you really are and hold on to it in the face of all of that psychological crap that's going to come for it, regardless of situation or environment. So it means you've got one face, one truth, one heart, and you show up with it no matter who you're with and no matter where you are. So I think that the pandemic has been a really interesting challenge when it comes to swagger because the upside, if I can call it an upside, when we add the word pandemic in there, the upside of the pandemic is the fact that people have no longer had to pretend that they are perfect. There, we, we know that nobody is shiny and perfect. There's craziness going on. You got your kids running around on the Zoom calls. The dog is barking in the backwards. You forget to put on your pants. You've gained weight. <laughs> You're, you haven't had a haircut in forever. You, your life is kind of a, a hot mess, but it's what we all face every day. It's just that some of us have spent a lot of time and energy trying to hide it and other people haven't. So now we are all the same in that Nobody is fooling anyone anymore. It is time to confess the mess and keep it real. So that's the upside of the pandemic when it comes to swagger. All right. So I am just like over here going, amen, sister, amen, <laughs> sister, because that's exactly what I, I, when I work with my clients is what I say, show up as yourself, stop this imposter syndrome, BS, sorry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if any coach is telling you that their life is perfect and nothing's going on, that they live it perfectly, they're go fire them. Right. Yeah. Oh, they're big fat liars. Exactly. Big fat liars. You yeah. Know? So, so for what I want to know is what happened in your life that said, this has got to get out to this world. Like what, what, what was that pivotal moment that said, listen, we need to get this out because people need to start waking up to who they really are. And I love, I love that you give them their hero name. I think it's so cool. Well, I, I have a training company called combustion and I've been traveling around the world training, you know, top, you know, four to 100 companies in 
all kinds of countries. I've worked in all kinds of cultures with levels of people from CEOs down to new entrants and focused on skills training, storytelling, presentation skills, leadership, and so on. But over time, I discovered this one fundamental human truth. And that's that people do not believe that they can reveal who they really are and still find the success that they're, they've been dreaming of. They mm -hmm. don't believe at their core that who they are is good enough to bring them the success that they want. And until you deal with that, no skills training in the world is going to transform your life. And, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I'm agreeing with you. Continue. Okay. And, and so what, what I started to do was to layer, I mean, I'd always been very human focused with my training. We're a very different kind of training company, super irreverent in your face, no BS, you know, not corporate in any way, shape or form. And one of the things that I always loved doing was really trying to crack people open in the room so that they could show their peers and their colleagues a little bit more of their authentic selves and get some positive reinforcements and positive validation, because that's kind of what sets the whole thing off. But when I realized that I went, no, 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 no. This is my whole focus now. That's all I want to do because I could see the magic that took place when people could get a better glimpse into the authentic self of others. The reaction was like, oh my God, I've never seen you like that. You're so much more powerful. That's amazing. People would cry. People, we would be in our pants laughing. It was such a beautiful thing. And then so many people told me that the experience had changed their lives. And I went, that's it. That's, that's that's what I got to do. So when you say that's all you got to do, you figured it out is that there's so many people that just cannot get out of their shell. They cannot find that why there. And then when they find the why, they just don't believe they can do it. There's mm -hmm. a, someone in the back of their mind telling them that. Did you have that before? So you broke through it. Well, I was very, very fortunate to be raised by parents who really reinforced who I was as a human being. They told me that my weird, quirky, passionate, creative, loud, vibrant self was fantastic. So I, I started at an advantage with that because so often the messages that we hear, even in our own homes from people who love us can be the beginning of the, the, the devolution, you know, the, the degrading of the swagger that we're all actually born with. And life has a way of, you know, chipping away at our psyches and all of the negative voices that we hear and all the opinions of others start to culminate. And we start to believe that it's true about us and our swagger progressively recedes. It starts to hide deeper and deeper inside. It's never gone. It's just hiding because it doesn't feel safe coming out to play with the world, right? So the advantage that I had was having that reinforced from the beginning, but do not think that I didn't face challenges along the road. I mean, I'm a lot of person and I am too much for some and I am not enough for others. But I learned that, that as I moved through all of my the crazy experience and careers I had in my life, I was a TV host for many years. I was a singer. I worked in the advertising business and I learned that you cannot be for everyone. And if you are, you're probably so bland, vanilla, nothing, that you're never gonna really make a big mark in this world anyway. So you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And at least, at the very least, you know who loves and accepts you for who you really are. And when you talk about revealing your true emotions it sounds like we're going to be swaggering through some fear oh yes girl yes there are i i have discovered what i what i consider to be the five key swagger blockers and each one of these is just part of the human condition it's you're, you're not there's nothing wrong or wrong with you or there's something bad if you're hitting these blockers because they are fundamental to who we are so um, it's either going to be persona, that belief that you got to walk and talk and dress and show up a certain way in order to be accepted by the world, in order to be taken seriously. It's going to be ambition, that that driving desire to reach the top and to, to be willing to do anything to get there, which can change who we are right. and can lead to uh, to you know negative behaviors that we don't connect with and that other other people don't connect with either. It can be insecurity, 
all of those negative voices in your head, all the tapes that play and make you question everything you do. It's where the imposter syndrome lives. It can be fear that that real it's the fear is real that if you reveal yourself to people bad things are going to happen you can really do a number on yourself believing that that may be the case and the last one is pain if you've experienced pain as a result of letting the real you come out and play and getting a, a knockdown or a smackdown you are going to be way more reluctant to do it again. So you now have scar tissue around that. And it could be from when you were six years old. It doesn't have to be recent, but your brain has a way of holding on to pain and recontextualizing it for the today and the now. So you, you know, you got laughed at doing a, a presentation on tree frogs in fourth grade because your fly was down. Now, every time you get up in front of people in a business setting, you want to fall apart because that pain is still is still there with you. So those are the the basic swagger blockers that will get in the way. I, I love that. I love to tell, I love to share the story about leaning into your fear, like leaning into what that is, right? Because I really believe in that we're all got this great gift and talent that's in us, right? That whoever you believe in, you know, I believe that God's given me these talents. And if we don't develop the talents, then we're, that we're kind of being selfish to not only ourselves, but maybe I needed to receive what your talent was. So, I mean, for you, I'm so glad your parents, you know, really pushed you in that, right? I mean, I wrote all those down because it's so true. Like, like you said, when I was younger, I walked in, I got a sign in my sophomore year of high school to do a speech class. And I was like, give me the H-E double hockey sticks out of this class. I am not standing in front of anybody now. And then look at me now, years later, you know, I meet this husband who's like, and that's, like you said, it went back to my parents. My parents didn't push me to go do that, right? So I was very shy. Then I meet a husband who says, if we're gonna argue, you have to be part of this argument because I can't figure you out, right? And so now he'll tell you, I don't shut up, right? But <laughs> now I go and I speak and I'm on stages and stuff, right? Like Jen's heard me speech and I would have never thought I would do that, but that's because I didn't, le I finally leaned into the fear of, you know, like getting, pushing past it. And I think that's just so powerful what you said about, you know, fear is real. And it can also be a liar to us because it's, you know, if we don't push through it, it's going to keep us back. Well, my mom used to always say to us, whenever we had, um, we expressed a dream, something we wanted, you know, all those lofty aspirations that you have when you're a kid. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a famous singer. I want to be on TV. And she would say to us, why not you? And she would wait for an answer. My mother didn't play. She'd be like, and why not you? And we'd come up with, you know, if we could come up with some reason as to why, we weren't good enough or smart enough or whatever, she would break it down. She would not let us walk away from that conversation believing the negative voices in our head. And what she also taught me, which I have brought through my entire life, I use it in my coaching all the time, is the question, what's the worst thing that could happen? Exactly. Like for real, what's, I play this game with, with people and it's called, and you guys use this game, it's a great tool. It's called, and then what? So when someone expresses a fear about some situation what i get them to do is to walk me through it literally moment by moment not in this big extrapolated picture but moment by moment so if let's say i'm just gonna make it up I, i'm afraid of of speaking up in a meeting with a boss that i find super intimidating and so i say okay so let's let's walk through it so we get into the meeting and okay and then what and then my boss starts talking and then what and then i disagree with something that he or she said and then what and then i say you know i don't necessarily agree with that and then what and then my boss gives me the kind of side eye and and the story continues and continues inevitably that story will end up with them saying and then i end up homeless on the street i get inevitably that i go okay good good you've gotten it out of your system great now, at what point did that story cease to be realistic? Let's just track back to the moment where you know that it ceased to be realistic, where your fear took over. And it's usually with, and then my boss gave me the side eye, right? So you pull it back to the place where you go. So what you're saying is realistically, the worst thing that could happen is you could get the side eye from your boss. How are you feeling now? They're like, well, it's not so bad. No, no, it's not. And even if we went three steps beyond that, the worst thing that would happen is only three steps beyond that, but it is not homeless on the street. That is not what's gonna happen to you. So contextualizing fear is super important. Why do we all end up on the street? <clears throat> I mean, that's my, that's my thing. I love what you said. I'm too much for some and not enough for others. And I find that 
true, especially in theater, especially in film, in the film industry, you know, it's exactly what, you know, and then what? And yeah. then what? Who cares? And you know, then what? Exactly. you got to find your tribe. You got to find your tribe and your vibe will connect you to your tribe. So it, it, they can't find you unless you're hiding. Forever. Leslie, sometimes it will take it forever just because you're just, you know, you're not getting yourself available for that trap. You think it might be social media in the old social media days. And really that's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. But with now the app, the, uh, the era of the social audio down, now you really can connect with your, your listeners and your followers compared to before you couldn't and get. Well, all you have, all you have when it comes to those audio uh, apps is to speak your truth. You can't, that's all you got. You can't, you can't hide behind no, filters can't. and glossy and fancy and, exactly. you know, and Photoshop. You just got to speak your truth. That's all you got. That's all. And so that, but that, then when you find that tribe, some people find it in specific, you know, opportunities or different things and they connect with them and, you know, communities, it's such an important thing because once they have it, then they know they truly want to follow you and go with you. And you have to just take that chance to put yourself out there to do that. And it also teaches you to be able to filter critici criticism uh, through the lens of from whom it comes. You know, yeah. that's the first thing that I look at whenever, whenever, because because haters going to hate, swagger haters going to come. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't control the world and their opinions. You know, that's that's called, you know, freedom of speech and democracy. Go nuts, people, whatever. Right. But just because you put it out there doesn't mean I have to pick it up. Like you wouldn't go to the airport and go grab some someone, some stranger's baggage off the carousel and pull it down the causeway. So why the heck would you do it in life? And that's what we do when we take yeah. on other people's crap and criticism and judgment. It's like it's like picking up their suitcase and then going to put on their dirty underwear when we get it home. No, thank you, ma'am. Not having it. Not having it. So I have a question for you. So yes. you've talked about these great companies you worked for, right? So let's talk about the smaller companies, like smaller coaches and, and things like that. So do you work with the smaller entrepreneur that is growing a coaching business per se? And then my other question is on your book, I'm sitting here going, wow, this, I just love your book. It's just so, I just read a little bit earlier today, but I was just like going, I work with a group, a great group of women. I'm like, they need this book, right? So I think we're gonna do a book club with it. So yes, let's go, let's do it, girl, yeah. let's do it. And I, because I come from a training background, I didn't want this book to just be fluffy, woofy, inspirational BS. I wanted it to be practical, pragmatic, actionable, doable. So there are countless exercises in the books, in the book, because you've got to do the work. You're going to have to break it down piece by piece, blocker by blocker, and systematically work through them in a way that you can start to see the change and see the result. So I also created a, a 40 page companion workbook to go with it because I wanted people to be able to, I didn't want them to have to mess up the pretty book because it's really pretty. And I wanted them to have not just what was in the book, but a whole bunch of bonus exercises so that they could use that and really turn it into their swagger Bible over time, because you're going to capture all of those swagger mantras and all of those exercises and all of the things that you're going to want to refer back to time and time again. And to answer your earlier question, I work with any and everybody. I've, I've got clients who are independent business owners, people who have startups, people who work within corporations, people who work within small companies, people who are trying to figure out what their next step is, who are not working at all. They're working on themselves as opposed to working on their business. So I, I'll work with anybody who wants to do the work. Right. That's all I care about. That's, that's my commitment. Awesome. Good job. Leslie, you talk, you talk about uh, what to do when you lose your swagger, but I am really interested in ways to protect your personal power. Mm -hmm. Once you get your swagger back, how do you protect it? How do you keep it? How do you, what do you do? People will come for our power in a million different ways. I, the, the, my visual for it is like, we are all this beautiful power buffet. Like, you know, when you go to that good Chinese food restaurant and they have that massive buffet with everything that you could imagine. You got little spring rolls, you got little sushis, you got little wontons, you got little snacky. I mean, it is just a feast for the senses. That's what we are to people. And those snackers are going to come. They're going to want a little taste and a little bite, and they're going to pick away at our power if we let them. Now, here's the thing about power. Here is the magic secret about power. 
No one can take it from you. Only you can choose to give it away. So don't. I want you to imagine those metal gates, you know, that that uh, that come down when the buffet is closed and people can <laughs> smell it and people can see it, but they cannot reach their stinky little fingers in there to get a bite of your good stuff. People will will try and take your power in in so many ways and for so many reasons. Sure. They'll do it to make themselves bigger and they have to make you smaller. And the more power you have, the more they're likely gonna have to try and take some of yours in order to bring you down sometimes people come for your power because they don't have any of their own and they're trying to you know get up literally get a piece of you people will do it in passive aggressive ways like trying to get you to apologize for something that you should not have to right. apologize for because you didn't do anything wrong they just didn't like it well sorry that's on you you know, as long as your intention is clear in this life, you should have to apologize for very little. So true. You know? All right. So Pearl, finish up with a question and then we'll go with the gratitude question. So I, you talk about your superpower. So I want to know what, what is your superpower name? Uh, well, I am the dynamite unleasher because that's what I do. I like to blow people open and pull out all of their good stuff. That's my superpower, really, is to be able to crack people open and pull all the stuff out of them and hold it up to the light for them to see. I love that. I, I think that's, what's your superpower, Pearl? My superpower is I am a connector. I will connect you to everything that you need to be connected to, to be able to find a, a, the path to put your self-care first. And if you don't work through that, that connection, then I'm going to come and hold you accountable to it. So I'm going to call you sticky soul connect. That's your superpower name. The sticky is the, is the bringing people together and holding them together. The soul is the way that you do it. And the connector is the end results. You are sticky soul connector. I love it, Neil. What's your superpower? Because you are a connector. <laughs> I don't know this. I guess superpower is I just, I can, I can handle any, uh, any challenge. You're like Superman in my life. <laughs> I can handle any challenge. You put, you throw it, throw a challenge at me. I can handle it, which again, it's an interesting thing. All right. Now we got to get to that gratitude moment. Jenks, we are. I love it. I love it. This is what I've been waiting for. So Leslie, we, we ask all of our guests one question. And it's, it's, it's not a surface question. This isn't, you're not thinking everybody like it's the wards or anything like that. I want you to drill down and take in one moment where you had a gratitude moment and it changed where you were going to where you are right now. I am someone who has a hard time asking for help. I like to give help. I'm not so comfortable uh, asking for help. But when I was going through this whole book launch thing, I realized that at some point I was going to have to reach out and ask for help because you can't do it alone. And you really need to reach out to your whole community and say, uh, hi, can you support me in this? And hi, can you do things for this? And, you know, and I was dreading it and I was agonizing. And I said to my, my friend, Jeffrey Shaw, who's also, also an author who had a book coming out at the same time as me. And I was, I was, like in tears and I was saying, I don't know what to do. I'm so uncomfortable about this. I don't, whatever. And he said, you know, Leslie, you have been paying into the bank of goodwill for such a long time and everybody knows it. And it is time for you to make a withdrawal and nobody is going to say no. And I was like, do you think? He said, I know this absolutely. And I, I took a step back and went, well, that's kind of true. So I guess I'm going to have to make that leap. So I'm, I was so grateful for him for reframing that because otherwise I would have been holding on to a lot of my own fear while I was going into this and feeling kind of apologetic by asking people to help me. But really I was giving them a gift because they, they, they got an opportunity to give back to me, which they all told me made them happy. So I was like, oh, that was a big learning moment for me. And I've, I've been so grateful for all the support. I'm telling you, it's been like, it's my, been my book mitzvah. And I feel like I, I've been hit by a Mack truck full of love. That's what the last little while has been for me. Wow. 
All right, Jen, close, uh, close out Leslie. This was such a great guest. Oh my gosh. We are so blessed because former TV host and advertising creative director turned training guru, Leslie M has spent her afternoon with us and we have to thank you, Leslie. And we are so excited about the way that you're gonna be transforming people's lives, putting more swagger into the world and helping us get through our fear so that we can swagger through our own life. And that is a huge gratitude moment. Thank you, Pearl. Sharenza from Successful Women's Living, Neil Haley from the Neil Haley Show in the PR department of Gratitude Radio Network and your beautiful day. Leslie, thank you, thank you, thank you. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at lesliem.com. That's L-E-S-L-I-E-E-H-M.com. You can check out the book at swaggerthebook.com and you can buy the book uh, at all good um, booksellers from the Amazons to the Barnes and Nobles to the Books A Million. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's a huge gratitude moment. So everyone, wherever you are, bring gratitude with you. Download it from heaven, send it out. And remember, you're blessed, you're loved, and you're sacred. Mwah. We love you. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you.